All right. Good morning, everyone. Uh, it's good to be back. Uh, my wife and I got back this Tuesday from being with family in her hometown of Boise, Idaho. And then we visited my parents who came to the Southwest to kind of meet us from not a too far distance in Vegas. Uh, but we didn't spend a lot of time there. We went to the Hoover Dam and the Grand Canyon, and there was another canyon nearby. And so we did a lot of things in the area uh, to see my parents. And uh, it's always good. We were back for three weeks, uh, took a long flight, flew through China. I don't recommend that, and if you can avoid it, but it was cheaper. Um, uh, but it's always good to, to be home, to reflect on both being home and also with our life here. And uh, having a season to reflect. Um, Pastor Greg left this uh, sermon open, so I was able to choose uh, whatever I wanted. Um, and I was you know, thinking about a number of different things. Uh, but I settled on something that I've been going back to in my life. Uh, what I mean by that is reflecting on again as a focus. You know? There are so many things in the Bible and in our lives, we can't think about it all at once. If you're like me, you tend to have seasons where you kind of focus on a thing that, that matters to you in a, in a season maybe that's uh, more important for that season than another. And we've been in, I've been in Korea now, and we've been here together for two and a half years, and I've just been thinking about uh, mission and uh, what mission looked like for me at a different age when I was younger, what it looked like uh, for me at a different season of life when I was single or in, in school versus now, where I'm married uh, in a different vocation as a, as a teacher, in a different context, Korea, serving uh, almost 15% of the students at HIS are Korean missionary kids, and uh, what mission is for them and the sacrifices that they've made and their parents have made. And I've also tried my best uh, with what's available in English to understand the history of Christianity and mission in Korea. Um, both to, to teach my students, because I found out they didn't know a whole lot about it, um, and also to, to know myself, to be encouraged and to learn from Korean Christianity. And there's so much to learn and to benefit from. Um, I should have put this in my slides, but I didn't, I didn't think about these book recommendations. But I read a book called The Korean Pentecost. Um, it's not written by charismatics. It's not, uh, it's not crazy. Um, it's actually written by uh, uh, Presbyterians, Pres the Presbyterian missionaries from America that came. And I was deeply encouraged by um, the revivals in the uh, turn of the century in 1900. And the mission, the, the deep sense of call, these missionaries were imprisoned um, by every tyrannical regime that would take over in Korea, by the Japanese, by the... Uh, the communists, they were there suffering with the Korean and the Korean Christians. And uh, the deep sense of mission sank so deeply into Korean Christianity that second only to the U.S., I think still to this day they send more missionaries than, uh, as, a, as a country than anyone else in the world. So those things have all come back. This new information, this new season of life. Um, I actually did do some postgraduate work in missiology, just studying mission as an academic discipline um, for a year and thinking about it practically, and that was in 2010, 2011, and uh, now with all this new experience, this new uh, information, uh, I go back to scripture and I think about those things with that fresh perspective, not in a sense that things have changed, they've deepened, they've deepened. And, and the one thing that is still true that I thought about and learned about then as well, um, is that everyone is on a mission. It may not be a good mission, but everyone, it's, I don't know if you've heard this before, but um, everyone worships something. Everyone has a purpose that's defined by someone or something, and it's the simple way to think of it, it's either from God or it's not. Um, it's either a mission for God, a, a worship towards God, or a purpose from God, or it's some other purpose that we created that our bosses create, that our society creates. And as Christians, we have to discern what our purpose is, what our mission is. Um, another uh, book I read um, was The Papyrus Basket about the creation of Handong. Um, that's a wild journey. Um, I just kept thinking, like, uh, it's a miracle this school exists. There's all kinds of problems that came, both internal, external, and yet it's 
here and, and uh, arguably functional. Um, it's actually very functional and, and in many cases the envy of, of the university system in, in some people's eyes and rightfully so and what, uh, what a testament that is to the Korean and Korean American and other Korean background Christians who gave time, money. Uh, I think I was just shocked by the, the founder who cashed out his pension to make a payroll. When the school was in uh, hurt, he had a pension from Keist. He cashed it out. These things matter. And as we think about mission in our context, it's very concrete, right? It's we're here because of mission. My school exists because of mission. So the question I'm asking myself is that we're thinking about it rightly. As we think about the mission of the Christian, our mission, are we connecting it to the dirt of our experience? Are we connecting it to the, the grand theme and the, the, the grand scheme and the clouds of the mission of God? You may have heard the Latin phrase, missio dei, uh, from whenever the church in the early centuries was thinking about what's the mission of God as they spread rapidly around the world. Um, and it's easy to get lost thinking about the mission of God. It's mind-blowing, right? And again, we're just human. We can't think about the full scope of the mission of God in creation and, and in the, the world and nature and ourselves and how we're supposed to do it all the time. It's hard to keep those things in balance. Um, so what I want to do today and what I've been thinking about, what I felt like God wanted me to share with you um, is as, as simply but as thoroughly as I can give you a framework for thinking about these things. Because I've never met a Christian who's not thinking about these things on some level. Because that's what the Holy Spirit does. We're constantly thinking about what's, what am I called to do? I mean, how many of you, college students especially, but even teachers and professors are thinking, am I, am I in God's will? Am I doing what God called me to do? Do I need to improve something? You know, it's, it's probably an active part of your prayer life. Even my uh, middle school students, you know, they're, they're asking themselves, what is God calling me to do? Um, I think even some parents of our elementary school we want, want their kids to be thinking about that. And that's a good thing, but we want to do it well. One of the things I was mesmerized by when I first came across it was this passage in John that we just read. Again, Jesus said, peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, I am sending you. Now, he said this to his disciples. This is nearing the end of John. Um, and I remember fixating on it because we all hear the great commission from Matthew, right? Go into all the world, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. And that's a great verse, great missionary verse. But this one caught me off guard because I'd never heard it until I was studying mission. And... Uh, I'd never heard it in the context of mission. And it adds, it adds an element that I hadn't considered at the time. And that's Jesus isn't just commissioning us to some mission in the way that, that I thought about it. It's not just this, my experience, and I need to go and do the things that God has asked me to do. He says, as the Father has sent me. And this is where we get into that mind-blowing part that's hard to comprehend sometimes because... What do we have to consider here? Well, we have to ask ourselves, how did the Father send Jesus? And when we ask that question, it brings us into a deep, a very profound and important and influential and positive doctrine, but a complicated one of the Trinity. Right? Both God the Father, and God the Son, and God the Spirit are all God, one being, but distinct in three persons. Foundational Christian doctrine shared by all the major branches of the faith. And in this very practical phrase, and something that, def I mean, in, in many ways defines Korean Christianity more than American Christianity, it defines all Christianity, but in experience, the Koreans have really put their stamp uh, as missionaries in the world. That something as practical as what Christians do with the gospel is connected to this grand thing of how the Trinity works as the Father. God the Father sent God the Son. Jesus looks at his disciples and says, the way he sent me, I'm sending you in a way that's like that. And that stuck with me. That Because that meant I needed to do some thinking. I needed to, to go back, reassess, and reanalyze the way I thought about what God called me to do. Um, and, not, and it's not a troublesome thing. It may feel weighty and burdensome. 
But that's because God is drawing us deeper into a knowledge of him and into an experience of him. Sometimes we put attention, an unnecessary, uh, uh, we make it unnecessarily a problem to come into the tension of, of knowing about God and experiencing God. A helpful illustration uh, can be read in, in C.S. Lewis's Mere Christianity, where he talks about doctrine is like a map and the experience of God is like sailing a boat across the Pacific Ocean. And he's like, or the Atlantic Ocean. I've been flying around oceans. I can't remember which one I'm in. Um, and he says that, uh, you know, the, the experience of God is like setting sail on the ocean. And that's what we want, right? We want that experience, the wind in our face, maybe like the Titanic, not me. That's weird. But, you know, you want that, ex- that feeling. But he said it'd be foolish to set sail without the map. You wouldn't know where you were going, right? Speaking of the Titanic. You wouldn't know where you were going. You could run into trouble. And he says, oftentimes people who want that deep experience of God, they think, oh, doctrine's not important. I don't want to. But he's like, you need to have that. That's part of the experience, a crucial part. It's to help us know where we are and that what we're having is an experience from God. And when it comes to mission, uh, we don't want to fall too much on either side. If we're setting sail in the, in the mission of God and we're only looking at the map, well, we miss all the beautiful things you can see, right? But if we only look at at what we can see and not at a map, we miss out on where we're going and if we're going the right way and we can be lost. I want you to have these categories in your mind because some of us, and some of it's just personality or the way God has wired you. You're more emotional. Okay, God gifted you with that. We need that. The church needs that. God's mission needs that deep, that deep uh, emotional, experiential faith. And some of us uh, like the more knowledge. We like the books. We like to understand things. And we could do without a lot of the experiences. And we need each other. So I'm not, it's not a, a shaming either side. It's saying we need this balance. And I find that balance captured in what Jesus has said here and many other things. This is often called uh, by missiologists to be the Isaiah 6 of the New Testament. Why does he say that? Well, if you remember in Isaiah 6, 8, um, it says, Then I heard a voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send and who will go for us? This is God talking. And Isaiah says, and I said, here I am, send me. And so uh, this idea of sentness, that we've been sent by God, that we are called, um, is true in the Old Testament, in the New Testament. It's true of us. That's the dots I want to connect. There's a sentness to the Trinity. There's a mission of God, of the Trinity, in these complex and beautiful nuanced ways all right and we have to hold those things in our minds as we work it out that'll help us that'll benefit us we want to keep the big picture in mind as we work out all the details of our life to assess is the mission we're on from god or is it not and i'm going to focus our study on the gospel of john now everything in any sermon that is said. There's a lot more that could be said about it. Um, but John provides a unique perspective that's on my heart, I feel like sharing with you, um, as the Holy Spirit inspired him. Um, historically, there's a ton of evidence that he wrote later than everyone else. He lived longer than, than the others. Um, while, uh, while Paul writes the most letters of the New Testament, Uh, While Luke wrote the most words in the Gospel of Luke and Acts, monster books, he wrote actually the most word for word, the most of the New Testament. John writes in the most theme, in the most categories, in the most genres. He writes a gospel. He writes 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John. Those are letters. And he writes the only prophetic book that we have in the New Testament, uh, Revelation. And he lived longer. He wrote that in, they assume, the year 90. And critics will come and say, well, the Gospels, uh, the writings of John can't be true because they were too far removed from the events, um, which is foolish because just because they're far removed from the event doesn't mean they're inaccurate. Often it means they've had more time to reflect. And the Holy Spirit using John as his handwriting piece, uh, you get that sense of deep reflection. John's Gospel is uh, treated as unique from the other Gospels, not because they tell a different story, um, but because his is more cosmic, right? And we're going to get to that in a second. Um, 
where Matthew starts with the birth of Christ and Luke starts with the birth of Christ. Mark starts with the beginning of Jesus' ministry. John starts with the beginning of time. He starts with the beginning of time. As we consider the mission of the Trinity, and this is a common symbol for the Trinity, again, trying to wrap our minds around uh, how the Father and the Son and the Spirit are one being but distinct in person. And we'll see that reality on clear display in the verses we read today. Uh, this is why the Trinity was, as a doctrine was formalized and believed by every major branch of Christianity. And it's a, it's a great um, sign of a cult if they deny the Trinity. That's very helpful. Um, as we think about the mission of the Trinity, uh, I want to just go back uh, again into John's perspective. One other thing about John is... Uh, He's the most intimate with Christ. He's the one who laid his head on, on Christ's chests. He's the one who stayed at the cross while Jesus was dying when everyone else fled. And Jesus looks at him and says, take care of my mom. Uh, you know, behold your mother. Mother, behold your son. As he's dying, he, he commissions John to take care of his family. Okay? So, and this is... I feel like it's a gift that we get these clues in the New Testament because it's easy to think, you know, the Bible falls out of heaven and it's this um, book, again, that blows our minds. It's hard to comprehend. But the Holy Spirit inspired people to write hum at a human level. He's not trying to hide anything from us. He wants us to know and understand. And knowing little details about the different authors in Scripture helps us relate to Scripture. That's by design. That's by design. So as we think about the mission of the Trinity and how John... Uh, am I hitting the right button here? Let's see. Or is it battery dead? No, the laser pointer works. David Lee, I'm asking for help. I'm phoning a friend. So just, just move me forward. If it doesn't work, it doesn't work. You can help me. Okay, that's good. I don't know if that was me or you. We'll find out soon. As we think about the mission of the Trinity... Again, John had more time to reflect. doesn't mean his gospel is better. It's just different. The historians who study the gospels actually say that the, the different approaches the gospel writers take uh, lends itself towards their authenticity historically. I would I greatly encourage you, if you struggle with that kind of thing, to study that. It's, um, it's a very helpful faith-building thing to do to study the the Gospels, and, and in their historical nature as well. John starts in the beginning. He quotes Genesis and then talks about creation. Right? This is by design. He's like, I'm going to go back even further. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was with God in the beginning. So now the Word is a He. So clearly he's talking about the Trinity, talking about the Father, God the Father, and the Word is God the Son. Through him, God the Son, is who he's referring to. Through him, all things were made. Without him, nothing was made that has been made. In him, Jesus Christ, God the Son, was life. And that life was the light of all mankind. And the light, the light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. Now, just get that connection. You know, he's going back to the beginning, and he's not just talking about in the beginning, quoting Genesis talking about creation in general. He's talking about the light. The first thing that was created, right? Uh, he separated the day from the night. And he's tying it to what Christ is doing now. God created life in the beginning. And God is creating new life now through Christ. With the gospel. With what he's done. Alright? To his audience. Connect those dots. What, who God was then. He's still the same God. And he's doing this thing now. Saving the world that took to darkness and sharing light with it. That's the mission of the Trinity, to expose the darkness with the light, and then they do it in a particular way. Okay, And then they, they go on to talk about John the Baptist and his ministry. They, he skips the birth of Christ. He leaves that to the other gospel writers. And in verse 14, oh, well, shoot and a miss. Help me out. Move me forward one. one uh, uh, there we go. We'll figure it out. Uh, the Word became flesh and made His dwelling among us. We have seen His glory, the glory of the one and the only Son. Right? He's very clear. Who came from the Father, full of grace and truth. 
And we'll get to the Holy Spirit eventually. This is focused on the Father and the Son. And, and we're just in the Gospel of John. There's much more in the rest of the whole, all of Scripture on all of these things. But I want to get us thematically through these. So give you a framework for thinking about the mission you're called to. We call this the incarnation. Again, from another Latin word when the, that came from when the, the church was predominantly Latin. And... Uh, you know, one of the things I enjoy going home is we can access a lot more affordable beef. And there's a point to this, I promise. And, you know, especially Mexican food. And I'm thankful for the Mexican restaurants in Pohong, but they do not live up to the standards that I'm used to. And there's all this carne asada and chili con carne and all these things. And carne just means meat, right? So when you think incarnation, it's Jesus in flesh. All right, a meated God, right? A meated God. I always, there you go. Now you can't eat beef without thinking about Jesus. You're welcome. You're welcome. Okay. So this is how John describes the incarnation. Now I make, I say all that to say, again, what are we? What's the focus of our, our topic this morning? As the Father sent me, so I send you. How did He send the Son to a very specific place, a specific people, the Creator? of all things dips his toes in the water of humankind and becomes like them right and if you wonder why the missionary impulse is to be so intimate I mean the studies on this are phenomenal there was a I think it was a secular study out of some university in Singapore that found that the biggest prediction of, of economic development in a society is if Protestant missionaries were there 40 years before I don't, I, I'm, I don't want to preach a whole other sermon or lecture on this. But it, and, and there's another thing, too. The Chinese government commissioned a study on their economic development. And there were Chinese communist commissioned uh, economists that said the Christian areas are the ones that have the most economic development. Why? Trust. Ethics. They can trust one another. There's more... Um, there's more ethical business transactions and things like that. What's my point? That this Christian impulse to relate to another person, right? To it go beyond, go outside of yourself. Jesus leaves the culture of heaven, comes to the culture of earth. Not just earth in a global sense, but specifically the Jewish people. And relates to them and takes on and, and uh, made his dwelling. It's a, it, the word that is used in the Greek is related to the tabernacle. The way that God lived with his people in the Old Testament. Jesus comes and lives amongst the people at this time. And then he tells the disciples, I'm sending you like that. So why do Korean missionaries scatter around the earth? Why were American missionaries here after the Catholic missionaries were basically slaughtered? And the first guy, a uh, Welsh guy, came to deliver Bibles in Pyongyang. And... Uh, he was with a bunch of non-Christian merchants who, who caused some trouble. And so the Koreans up there uh, killed him, killed them all. Um, and the last thing the, the Welsh missionary did is throw a, a bag of Chinese Bibles because he heard that the educated Koreans knew Chinese. And he throws a bag of Chinese Bibles into the hands of the Koreans as they take their bamboo spears and spear them to death. Why do we do that? Why would we, you know... At least, even the attempt. He wasn't even that good at incarnating. He didn't know Korean. But it was worth it to him to die and try. And then that was in like 1880, 1860. And then some 20, 40 years later, uh, Christianity is taking hold. And the Bible is being translated into Korean. And now Koreans are missionizing the earth. Everywhere you go, there are Korean missionaries. As the Father has sent me, so I send you. That's what's happening. What does that look like for each of us individually? Well, we've got to work through more. And sorry, David, I don't know what happened to my... Oh, I think, I think we got it. Thank you. Uh, so let's look at the mission of God the Father. I'll move a little more quickly to get us down into the, the dirt again. Um, again, I want to uh, stick in with the Gospel of John. Think of, it, you know, think of the most popular verse in the world. I mean, even non-Christians know this verse. They hold it up. In America, they'll hold it up behind the, their enemy's free throw goal to try to distract people shooting free throws. The fans will. Because everyone knows it. So instead of shooting a free throw, you'll be thinking about God's love. You know? I'm thinking that's a good thing, actually. 
For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son. We don't often think about the Trinitarian nature of John 3.16. It's very Trinitarian. That whoever believes in him, the son, will not perish but have eternal life. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. A question you may ask is, well, then why is there any condemnation if, if he didn't send him in the world to condemn? Well, the world has already condemned itself. The world has already condemned itself. Sometimes church movements or certain groups of Christians uh, will make the mistake of thinking it's their job to condemn everyone. All right? There's a very famous, infamous group in America, a church that, that protests like funerals and, and and is trying to tell people they're going to hell. That's all they do. They're known nationwide as, worldwide, as this, this hateful church. Well, they've, they've made a mistake in their missiology. Our job is not to be the ones condemning. They've condemned themselves. Our job is to share Christ. Our job is to share Christ. And, and often, this is, this is what Jesus is talking about uh, when he talks about not being judgmental. He's not saying ignore evil, ignore sin in your own life or someone else. It can be acknowledged, but we're not the ones who condemn. The condemnation is, is clear. The condemnation becomes clearer the more we share the truth. The light exposes the darkness. That's what God did in the beginning. That's what he did with Christ. Okay? And there will be times to make that what the evil is clear and to talk about it. But our, if you're going to emphasize something, you emphasize the goodness of Christ and who he is and why he's good. This is good missiology. How do you do that in your life, in your culture? There will be some nuance to it. The Americans are probably going to do it a little differently than the Koreans. And uh, I try to, to study that a lot just because I teach a lot of Korean students and Korean missionary kids. And I don't want to assume that the way that Americans do it is always the way that uh, Koreans should do it. And it's helpful and healthy for me to do that. That's... Uh, one of the ways that uh, God is able to teach me more about what he's doing and challenge me and my assumptions. Jesus says, just as the living Father sent me in John 6, 57, and I live because of the Father, so the one who feeds on me will live because of me. He's talking about uh, communion in this passage in John 6, and he's explaining why it's important. And uh, he says, again, he emphasizes the Father's, part of the Father's mission is he sent me. And part of that mission is I'm, uh, you're going to feed on me and live because of me. The Father's mission is to send the Son to save the world. Okay? Part of that is, you, as we'll see as we work through this, is calling us to that same mission. And I think I meant to mention it with Isaiah because one of the things, if we remember, uh, from Isaiah is... Um, he, he thought he was going to die when he saw God. We need to remember to be humble and that it's kind of ridiculous that God wants us to do anything. Right? I think in Banksy's prayer time, he emphasized that this morning of we don't deserve anything. We're nobody. We have to remember God's mission to us. Right? That's another thing that gets twisted sometimes. Jesus saved me. Part of God's mission is I needed saved. So when I'm out trying to help other people get saved, I have to stay humble. That's another thing, especially if Christianity has become a part of a, uh, of a culture for a long time and, and is uh, normative like it is in the States. I don't know about Australia. Um, uh, or normal. Because it's not normative in Korea, but it is normalized. There's 30%. Um, and, but in America, even today, people on surveys, the surveys come back and it's like, more than 50% answer in a way that seems Christian, even if there's questions about how nominal or legitimate their Christianity may be based on their behavior. Um, but that's, a, that's normative at that point. And if you get to that point, then it's normal and beneficial uh, culturally to be Christian. Like, um, you know, you get kind of in the inside club of, of different things culturally. Um, then it's easy to judge outsiders quickly who aren't like you, um, and forget that our mission is to them, right? So, for instance, the majority of my students are Christian, but I did a survey, and 25% of our 11th graders and 12th graders um, are pretty much saying that they're not Christian. 25% last year, 
And so some, you know, some, and it's understandably sad at a Christian school. You don't want that. But I said, you know, I am saddened by it. I don't know all the reasons why. But that's kind of my priority. As a Christian school, we have the blessing and the benefit of showing Christ, not judging, because there, you know, there's going to be different thoughts, but answering questions. We'll, we'll get to that about how Jesus um, is very open with questions. We should be too. Just because people are questioning doesn't mean their faith is gone. It might be their path to faith. It's an opportunity. That's the, the shift that if Christianity has been a part of a culture for a long time, or if we've grown up Christian, it's hard to switch and remember, oh, our mission is to these people who are, we view as very sinful and we view as a problem and uh, maybe a detriment to society. They're our mission. The people who protest Hondong for having conservative biblical views of marriage or anything like that. I, I don't like it either, but I'm like, hey, there's people in Pohong. That's, I hope we're reaching them. I hope we're explaining ourselves well. You know, they may hate us forever. I don't know. But that's our mission. They hated Jesus too. They killed him. He didn't say it was going to be easy or any different than what he went through. They're our mission. That's our mission field. All right, it didn't work again. Oh, there he is. In Jesus' high priestly prayer, and I need to move along because I'm running out of time. Um, Jesus' high priestly prayer, he... Uh, it says, as he's praying to God the Father, as you sent me into the world, I have sent them into the world. For them I sanctify myself, that they too may be truly sanctified. Really what I'm trying to show is just that this theme of the Father having sent the Son, you know, we started in 21, we went back to all the way to the beginning, and all through, Jesus is saying, the mission of the God the Father was to send me to save the world, and I'm going to send you in a similar way. The mission of the Son... Looking in John uh, 6 again, starting in verse 38. For I have come down from heaven, uh, not to do my will, but to do the will of him who sent me. And keep in mind, as the Father sent me, so I send you. He's doing the will of the Father. We should do the will of the Father. And this is the will of him who sent me, that, that I shall lose none of all those he has given me. But raise them up on the last day. For my Father's will is that everyone who looks to the Son and believes in Him shall have eternal life. And I will raise them up at the last day. And one thing I'll mention uh, is there's a, an in-house conflict. What I mean by that is among Christians, uh, you know, you fight differently with your family than you do with an enemy. And sometimes Christians have a family fight. One of the family fights in Christianity is how God's sovereignty works in relationship to human uh, responsibility. So uh, particularly with salvation, does God save people before the world began? Or, or do humans all have equal footing and then all choose uh, on their own? Um, I'm not going to present that. I have an opinion. Um, I'm not going to present that opinion here today. I along with Pastor Greg, and I, I, I'm not sure about all the elders, um, uh, but I tend towards a, the reformational view of that. Um, if you have questions, you can ask me later. But here's the point. The reason we're all still in the family of God is uh, we don't know the journey that people are on. Our job is to not have sovereign knowledge over a person if we see them in deep sin or, or living a perfect life, if that's what it looks like. Um, we know that Jesus is going to raise up all the Father have given him. So whenever we're on our mission, guess, what's not, guess what we're not responsible for? We don't get to choose who's in and out. The person who's furthest away from God may be the one who moves closest to him. The Bible's full of examples of that. Uh, and that's another thing we can get confused on. Um, we need to remember that part of the mission of Christ, he's the one that's going to save the ones who are connected to God by whatever means. And that's why Christians can have this family fight and still work together on the mission field, even if we have different denominations and things like that, because we still have that goal. We might do it a little differently. I've heard uh, a joke that's made is you want to you uh, work like uh, an Arminian, a person who believes that it's up to humans to choose God. You want to work as if you believe that, and you want to sleep like a Calvinist as one who trusts God has already done it and we're just kind of working out his will. And I think that's the kind of, it's a joke, but it's a, a healthy way of kind of seeing that tension. And yeah, we got to work. We don't know who's saved. When we're on mission, 
we see people who need to understand and know who God is or be discipled more deeply into that, uh, even ourselves, and we work. We don't know what their path will be. Um, you know, and the Apostle Paul is a great example of that. And we'll look at another example before we close. So anyway, the mission of Christ to, uh, to save those the Father has chosen. Personally, we need to think of that personally. He saved us. That should be a motivator for mission. Not, I got to do what God asked me to do or he's going to hate me. That's God's work to save people. We just share what he's done. It's not meant to be this like I, you know, shame myself because I haven't done everything I'm supposed to do. It's Jesus has done all the work and I'm just going to tell people about it. I'm going to extend hospitality to my enemies. I'm going to extend hospitality to, to anybody who will listen to this message. Um, within our family, uh, there's, there's divorce and there's people who are Christian in that family and people who are not. And uh, Ashley and I had a chance to share with uh, one of our family members and her boyfriend, uh, just share our testimony with them. They're not Christian. And they just had a positive response. I don't know what their journey is, um, but it's, it's not my job to choose them or not. It's my job to tell them and, and then let God do the work and be available to be part of that work. All right, so I just want to encourage you in that. All right, I'm, gonna, I'm moving towards the end here. Uh, i got a lot to cover, but that's okay. I'll move quickly. The mission of the Spirit. Um, how about this? I'll read it and I'll make one comment on it. You can reflect on it. There's three slides worth because it's, it's uh, a section where Jesus just goes long explaining how the Spirit works. When the advocate comes, whom I will send to you from the Father, God, Father sent the Son, both send the Spirit. There's a lot of sending going on. The Spirit of truth who goes out from the Father, he will testify about me, Christ. And you also must testify. Oh, it's the Father sent me, so I send you. For you have been with me from the beginning. All this I have told you so that you will not fall away. They, uh, they will put you out of the synagogue, these people that are supposed to be your brothers and sisters. In fact, the time is coming when anyone who kills you will think they are offering a service to God. That's exactly what Paul thought he was doing, Saul thought he was doing before he became a Christian. They killed, he was killing people. We forget that. They will do such things because they have not known the Father or me. In John 5, Jesus actually says to the Pharisees, you think you're doing the will of God, but you don't know you don't know the Father, and you don't accept my words. Moving on, and now in John 16, 4. I have told you this so that when the time, their time comes, you will remember that I warned you about them. I did not tell you this from the beginning because I was with you, but now I am going to him who sent me. None of you asks me where are you going. Rather, you are filled with grief I have, uh, because I have said these things. But very truly, I tell you, it is good, uh, for your good that I am going away. Unless I go away, the advocate will not come to you. The advocate's the spirit. But if I go, I will send him to you. When he comes, he will prove the world to be in wrong about sin and righteousness and judgment. About sin, because people do not believe in me. About righteousness, because I am going to the Father where you can no longer see me. And about judgment, because the prince of this world now stands condemned. I have much more to say to you, more than you can now bear. But when he, the spirit of truth, comes, he will guide you into all truth. He, the spirit, will not speak on his own. He will speak only what he hears. And he will tell you what, he is, uh, what is yet to come. He will glorify me because it is from me and, uh, that he will receive what he will make known to you. All that belongs to the Father is mine. That is why I said the Spirit will receive from me what he will make known to you. Now, there's a lot to be said here doctrinally, theologically, um, but missiologically. We don't always know why God designed mission or anything to function the way it did. Why did he send Jesus but then have to take him back so that they could send the Spirit we don't know why, but we know that he did, and we know that it's good. That's what Jesus says. And he says, I'm going to send the Spirit to all of you, and you're going to go out, he says in another gospel, and do greater things in more mass. Because now all of you have the Spirit, and he will make these things clear to you and guide you into all truth and things like that. So that's a summary. 
and it actually took just about all my time. I have a lot more to say, and I'm going to have to summarize that even more. That's a summary of the mission of the, the Trinity in some detail, only from one book. And I say that it should, it should encourage us, motivate us. There's a lot to reflect on and to think about and how it informs the mission of a church. Um, and I'll summarize this. In John 17, Jesus prays what's called the high priestly prayer, and he prays for himself, and then he prays for the disciples, and then he prays for those the disciples will influence. And he says, my prayer is not for them, the disciples alone. I pray for those who will believe in me through their message. That all of them may be one, Father, just as you are in me and I in you. May they also be in us so that the world may believe that you have sent me. Why should the church be unified? Is it just to have a happy time? Is it just to be best friends only? Or is there more to it? There's more. The church should love each other and be unified and work through their conflict differently and, and work through life differently so that the world will know that God the Father sent God the Son and that we're on that same mission and that they can be a part of that too, that that mission is to them and for them as well. And that's what the church is to be about. Um, I'm going to skip the rest and just leave that point there. You can read all of John, or John 17. Uh, but I want to get to this uh, final point, uh, the mission of the Christian, maybe, generally speaking. And uh, this uh, image is of the woman at the well, which we're going to look at. And it was a stained glass window in, in a church where I met my wife. And uh, we saw a lot of people get become Christians in that church. And I often reflected on this uh, story from John 4 of the woman at the well. Because we were in Portland, Oregon, and Portland and the West Coast in general is not uh, a predominantly Christian place. Uh, there was a joke that there are more, um, there are more dogs than people, for one thing, because uh, people love their pets more than humans. Uh, but there are definitely, uh, you know, more probably cats than Christians, that kind of a thing. We'd make jokes about that. <clears throat> and it's one of the, you know, an area of the country that's one of the least churched. And we would see these uh, people who were far from God become Christian. And I grew up in a very churched area. I didn't always see the, you know, the male prostitute become a Christian. I didn't always see the drug addict turn their life around and become a Christian. Or the adulterous married couple reconcile and, and become Christians. I didn't see that a lot growing up. And it was a different context. There were other good things that happened. But this was pretty, pretty radical um, to me. And I often reflected on Jesus and the woman at the well from Samaria. And I'm just going to summarize it and then read the final point because there's way too many slides. And the, um, way too, well, it's just it's the Bible, so I can't apologize too much. Uh, but basically, we know that Jesus was at this well. The disciples were taking a break. Uh, they were going uh, into uh, they're going north, and uh, they run into the woman in Samaria, or Jesus does, and she's coming there, and it's. Again, John's saying things like it's noon. Uh, these are clues that this woman is going to the well at a time of day when no one else will be there. She's an outcast, even in her own community. And she has an encounter with Jesus. And she makes the point, you're not supposed to be talking to me on two accounts. I'm a woman and I'm Samaritan and you're a man and Jewish. So uh, the gender tension should not allow this to happen and the... Uh, religious tension should not allow you to ask me for a drink of water. Um, and Jesus doesn't miss a beat. Uh, verse 10 here, he says, If you knew the gift of God and who it is that asked you for a drink, uh, you would have asked him and he would have given you living water. And there's kind of two things going on here for us to reflect on. One is that Jesus is a great missionary. We, we often think, well, he's the Savior, of course. Uh, but we can learn from him. I often think in one conversation... We'll see. I mean, he, this woman basically converts and becomes a missionary. And the disciples are all confused by it. But this adulterous woman in a relationship with five different guys, you would think, she's got problems. She's not very close to God. And we'll see her example beats the example of the apostles. So part of the mission of a Christian is we have to encounter Christ. 
So we can learn from Jesus and how he does mission. But he's like the all-star, right? We can also learn from the Samaritan woman because we're sinners too, right? We need to encounter Christ and we need to encounter sinners the way that Jesus encounters them. We can, we can share a meal. We can do things together. We can show love and we don't have to ignore sin to do it. Uh, she goes on in verse 11, sir, the woman said, you have nothing to draw with, the well is deep. Where can I get this living water? I don't know about you, but if you have, like, uh, friends who are not Christian and know nothing about Christianity, I remember one time I had a conversation with a coworker, and I was talking about denominations, different church types, and he thought I was talking about different types of money, like a different denomination of money, and other things that I was just like, they don't, he doesn't know anything. And this the woman at the well is kind of like that. You know, she's like, you know, what are you talking about, this living water? She's taking it very literally. And... Um, Verse 13, you know, Jesus answered, Everyone who drinks this water will be thirsty again, but whoever drinks the water I give them will never thirst. Uh, Indeed, the water I give them will become in them a spring of water welling up to eternal life. And we need to hear the gospel. We need to share the gospel. We need to hear the gospel. We receive the mission from God, and we also are on the mission of God. Okay? And that's what's happening here. And and notice, she, she doesn't get it right away. Maybe you don't all, didn't get it right away before you became a Christian or when you were a kid if you grew up in the church. Many people I've shared the gospel with do not understand it right away, even if they stay curious. Some reject it out of hand. But just because someone doesn't quite get it right away doesn't mean you're done with them. God might still want you to pursue that uh, relationship. Um, expose sin, your own. And it's okay to talk about the sin of others. Um, the woman said to him, Sir, give me this water so that I won't get thirsty and, and have to keep coming here to draw water. Verse 16, he told her, Go, call your husband and come back. And Jesus knows what he's doing here. He is exposing her sin. And she says, I have no husband. And Jesus says to her, You are right when you say you have no husband. The fact is, you have had five. And the man you are now with is not your husband. But you, what you have just said is quite true. He's actually a little sarcastic. Oh, that's not very good mission. He's not, he's not being nice. He's being truthful. And he was already nice. He had already invested in the relationship. He broke down the barriers of the society. He started it. He asked her for the drink of water. He invested in that relationship. Now he can do something that is a little risky for the sake of the gospel. We can do the same thing. And she doesn't run away. In fact, she's shocked. All right? And she's like, okay. Um, I can see you are a prophet, right? She doesn't run away. If you share the gospel, you'll have people who are in sin, whether they know it or not. Many of them want out. They just don't know how. It can take a lot of time. It can take patience. Sometimes we're that person, and we need people to be patient with us and help us. I just want to encourage you, take the time. This is how I feel about my students. Right now, that's my predominant area of mission. She asks questions, and they're a little deflecting. It's like, I just exposed that you're in adultery, and now you want to have a theological conversation about worship? Right? Jesus takes the time to answer her questions. She asks questions, our ancestors worship on this mountain, but you Jews claim the place to worship is in Jerusalem, and Jesus clarifies for her. There will come a time where we're just looking for worship in spirit and truth. And he goes on to explain. Whole other slide. You know, God is spirit. His worshipers must worship in spirit and in truth. And then she's like, well, I've heard of this Messiah is coming, and he'll explain everything to us. And Jesus says, I, the one you are speaking to, am he. And then the disciples come back, and they're surprised to find him at the woman. They're supposed to be on Jesus' mission. He hasn't yet told them everything. But notice how far away they are. They're close to Jesus, but far from his mission. And she's kind of far from Jesus in her relationship, but closer to the mission. And the two will come together, and that's why John writes this story to his own shame, probably, at the time. Maybe you think about these things. You know, what do you want? Why are you talking with her, right? Why are you hanging out with this Samaritan woman? And then you found out she's an adulterer? What is wrong with you? So she goes, then leaving her jar... Urgently, she, she went back to town and said to the people, come and see a cool guy I talked to. Just 
talk about how good he is, but not herself? No. Come see a man who told me everything I ever did. And the implication is everything I ever did wrong. Right? She was at the well in the middle of the day, so she wouldn't be around people. Now she's going into their midst. And she's not sure, could this be the Messiah? But she's already gone and done more mission than the disciples did. She's brought people to Jesus. She's shared her own sin. She's made it clear. Yeah, he told me everything I ever did wrong. Meanwhile, the disciples urge Jesus to eat, and he tells them the same thing he was telling her. She talked about water. He's talking about food and trying to explain that uh, I'm feeding you physical food. I'm talking about eternal life. I need you to understand that there's more to life than what's going on in your belly, right? There's an eternal thing going on. And he's saying, what does he say? 35. Uh, it's about harvest. I tell you, open your eyes and look at the fields. They are ripe for harvest. Even now the one who reaps draws a wage and harvests a crop for eternal life. He's talking about himself, talking about God the Father. So that the sower and the reaper may be glad together. Thus the saying, one sows and another reaps. And he says, I sent you to reap what you have not worked for. Others have done the hard work, and you have reaped the benefits of their labor. He's talking about the prophets. He's talking about everything that came before. He's talking about what God has done in people's lives. And, and you may have the hard work, right? There are people that I knew when I was in high school who were far from God, and I would try to share the gospel with them. And, I, and it was horrible. It was just, it was, they would do whatever they want, drink whatever they wanted, smoke whatever they wanted, have sex with whoever they wanted. And it's not till years later I get a message on Facebook, I'm going to church, I'm a Christian. Someone else had the joy of reaping what me and a lot of my Christian friends invested in in, in high school. Uh, that's okay, that's good. I want you to know that that might be the season you're in with a difficult person in your life. We have difficult people in our family, and I'm, I'm trying to think long term, okay? 20 years from now, could it be different? Because right now, it's not good, <laughs> All right? And I'm not saying it's horrible. We actually had a great time, but, but spiritually, they're blind. That's what I mean by not good, All right? We have a good relationship, but spiritually, they're blind. I want it to be better and different. This uh, story is encouraging to that end. But notice this, verse 39. Many of the Samaritans from that town believed in him because of the woman's testimony. He told me everything I ever did. Her repentance led them all to him. And furthermore, so when the Samaritans came to him, they urged him to stay with them. And he stayed two days. And because of his words, many more became believers. They said to the woman, we no longer believe just because of what... Uh, you said to the woman, no, not, it's not just your testimony. Now we've heard for ourselves. And we know that this man really is the savior of the world. Uh, earlier, John the Baptist has a similar situation where his disciples go to leave him and go to Jesus. In fact, some of Jesus' disciples, uh, earlier in John, they leave. I think uh, Andrew is one of them. And John's like, yeah, I have to become less. He has to become great. This is uh, too often... A flaw of Christian leadership is we want to attach everyone to ourself or create a branded ministry that, that has to be uh, curated like a garden. It's our field. This is our church. This is our uh, ministry. This is my ministry. These are my disciples. I don't like that. God is going to call them. The Spirit is going to get into this person. They may, I may have known them from being a non-Christian to a Christian to discipling them for a long time. They might need to go... And, it, and they can connect with Jesus on their own. They have just as much of the Holy Spirit as I do, even if I've been a Christian longer. There's no half portion. Right? I have a full Holy Spirit. You have a half. You're a half calf. I'm full calf. Coffee. No, it's not like that. Everyone gets full calf. Full caffeinated coffee from the Holy Spirit. All right? Yes. God bless you. Okay? And uh, it should encourage us. So whatever it looks like in your context, this is the point. You can think about the grand scheme of the mission of God and be in wonder at how he, it all ties into his mission, his creation, everything through human history. And, and, and you should be filled with awe. You should reflect on those things. And it should tie into your mission, whatever it is you've been called to. You may be a teacher. You may be uh, married or not married. That may explain you, but it doesn't define you. What defines you is you're created in the image of God to be on his mission, to experience his mission, which is his love, which is his light, which is his joy, 
which is also his suffering, right? And I think Korean Christians, I've learned a lot from them about endurance, okay? Especially through history. I just, uh, I, I weep when I read Korean history and how the Christians have suffered and, uh, and there's a lot to learn for that. Other Christians have too, but it's deep in the Korean psyche and it's deep in Korean Christianity's psyche. And so I want to encourage you, you have a powerful heritage. Um, and I hope you take that with you. Um, whatever happens the rest of the year, earthquakes, whatever, protests, other, uh, other things that we can't imagine or think of now. Don't forget his mission. It was never meant to be easy. Um, it's a miracle that this place is even here. It's here because of uh, God, and it's here because of faithful Christians, many of whom, including us, don't always get it right. And I hope there's a lot of things we work through as a community at Hondong, both in our school and in the university. Um, but it's worth it. And I don't know what will happen, but even if a nuclear missile struck Hondong, God's mission would not stop. It would go on. And we can rest, and that can inform how we do it here with the time and the effort, the energy we have. So I encourage you with that. A final book recommendation, uh, Tim Keller's Encounters with Jesus. He talks about the way Jesus interacts with individuals, and it was helpful at drawing out how, how good of a missionary, how good of a pastor he was. He's, again, he's God, of course. Uh, he's good at these things. But it's helpful then to learn from Christ. He uses some of the examples I shared today, and I found it to be helpful for further reading if you're interested. Uh, if the praise team wants to come up, and as they do, um, as we conclude, and I guess we're beyond conclusion, uh, we'll sing a song. But, but as they come up, let's pray. And I just want you to thank God for his mission to us. Let's spend time praying, thanking God for his mission to us. And, uh, and ask him, am I on your mission? Clarify for me, you know, what that looks like. Uh, just give me peace about it and help me to follow you wherever you're leading. Uh, I'll pray and they'll sing. And when they're done singing, you can be dismissed. Lord, we thank you. We ask you to speak to us, help us follow you in all things. Uh, thank you for the example of, of John and his writing and the Holy Spirit who inspired him. And please help us to reflect deeply on, on what you've called us to and how you've uh, created us in your image, in the image of a trinity that is a community that is unified um, and then commissioned a church that is supposed to be a community that is unified and then uh, sent us out as missionaries to a, a broken, ununified, unloving, often unloving world to bring the light into a darkness. Uh, help us to cling to that, to love that, and to endure, and to learn from the wonderful heritage of so many who've gone before us to do that. Help us to continue. And we pray this in your son's name. Amen.